Welcome to Monitor the World. Um, so, quick agenda. Um, I'm Nick. I'm going to first walk through a pretty high level intro to monitoring um, to get us all on the same page. Um, I'm going to briefly discuss monitoring applications uh, in a Kubernetes environment, but a lot of it applies to just monitoring applications in general. Um, and then I'm going to touch on monitoring the Kubernetes control plane, uh, especially in the context of as you scale your cluster. Um, and then my co-presenter, Nick, will walk us through how Planet Labs set up their monitoring infrastructure, which is the actual interesting part of the talk. Um, and so our theme is going to be on, on sort of how to focus on fewer um, but more important metrics. So who am I? Um, I'm currently working uh, for Amazon EKS. Um, and I formerly worked at a couple of Seattle startups, uh, Porch and OfferUp, if you've heard of them. So quick story, the reason that I came to Seattle was actually in 2015. Um, I moved up to work at Porch. And my first day on the job, my colleague uh, mentioned that over the last couple of days, he had moved the entire production uh, website onto this really cool new technology, which I had never heard of, called Kubernetes. So I was like, OK, that's, that sounds very interesting. I did a quick Google search. I noticed that it was at version 0 0.4. Um, and so I asked him about it. And he explained about, at the time, replication controllers and all of this stuff. And then he mentioned, he's like, oh, by the way, um, Actually, I'm, I got a job at Google, and my last day is on Friday, so have fun with it. <laughs> so that was my very exciting introduction to Kubernetes, and it went well. Um, so um, why do we monitor? This is fairly self-explanatory, but um, obviously the most important thing is we need to be able to detect problems as they happen, and then secondarily, um, but almost as important, we want to be able to prevent future outages. For example, if you have a disk somewhere that's on its way to filling up, we'd like to get an alert maybe 12 hours before it fills up so that we can actually do something about it. Um, or, you know, for us, we would like to know if a data center is running out of capacity and somebody needs to go and build a rack before, we can, before our customers can launch more clusters. Um, and then, Another reason to monitor would be optimization. Um, so for example, if you want to understand uh, how to make your applications more efficient and potentially save on cost. And additionally, for me, because I'm incredibly nosy, I want to understand why Nick told me um, that his service was going to have a certain QPS, but it's actually 100 times more than he promised. right? But monitoring in a modern microservice environment is actually pretty difficult. A lot of us are in the process of breaking our monoliths up into many microservices. And as we do that, each additional microservice introduces a wealth of metrics. Um, and each additional microservice also means we have all these complex interactions between them. Um, and the way that we often use containers in Kubernetes environments uh, is, is a little bit more transient um, so looking at the picture at the VM level doesn't tell us the whole story anymore. So we need new tools. Uh, and then something that Nick is going to touch on later is sort of the organizational aspects of monitoring, right? In an organization where you have many different service teams running many different services, they have different requirements. Um, and so it's hard to find a one-size-fits-all strategy um, when you have all these different users with different needs. But it's helpful to approach this problem with a method. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with both of these, but I'll reiterate them. Um, so a common uh, way to th of thinking about monitoring resources is the use method. Uh, this was first coined by Brandon Gregg. And it states, for every resource, we want to check utilization, saturation, and errors, where utilization is a measurement of the time that we use the research resource over the total time. Where, and saturation is more of an instantaneous measurement of, of uh, use, where we could, we could think of it as like a, 
um, a counter in Prometheus or an integer that represents maybe the number of processes waiting for a CPU or waiting on disk. Um, and then the other methodology is the red method, uh, which was introduced by Tom Wilkie. And this is primarily geared towards monitoring web services. And it states uh, for every service, we want to monitor the request rate, the, uh, the, the errors, and the duration or latency. So here's a, an, a graphic of what a Kubernetes cluster or metrics environment might look like um, on your cluster. So we have two worker nodes. Um, and we have our applications themselves. You can see the pods running there. Um, in this case, we've chosen Prometheus as our metrics pipeline. So each of our applications is instrumented with a Prometheus endpoint. And Prometheus is going to pull the metrics from there. And since we're running in Kubernetes, we also have a kubelet running on each node, which has C Advisor embedded in it. And that gives us very rich container level metrics. Um, so, and then for at the node level, we have the node problem detector and the node exporter, which both give us information about our, our nodes themselves. And the node uh, exporter actually works outside of Kubernetes as well. Um, and then we have a couple of things. For example, HPA, which actually acts on the metrics that we gather, uh, allows us to scale up our pods. Um, and then there's some ortho orthogonal topics, such as we have a logging daemon in there. Um, we also have the metric server, which is part of the Kubernetes core metrics pipeline. So that's something um, that is, uh, gives us metrics in the moment on pods and nodes, so CPU and memory, it's something that can be used by, consumed by the horizontal pod autoscaler. Um, and then uh, lastly, we have cube state metrics running there. And that's something that actually looks at the, it derives metrics off the entire Kubernetes API. So we'll quickly talk a little bit about uh, monitoring applications. And what I want to focus on is how we pick our most important metrics, right? What are we, what are we putting at the top of our dashboards? Um, and, and so where do we start? And our advice is start with your users. Um, and if you can, that means starting with your business metrics. So if you're an online bookseller, it might be orders fulfilled successfully. Um, maybe you're a rideshare company, so it would be rides completed. Um, or maybe you're a company that launches satellites into space and takes pictures, so then you might be measuring how many pictures you successfully take and send back down to Earth. Um, but beyond those business-specific metrics, um, what comes next is essentially the metrics that work across the board. So this is where we go back to the red method for monitoring web services. And these, can be, these metrics can be really helpful for, for example, for an operations team that's setting up uh, default metrics and dashboards for their organization that work for everyone. Um, and Nick's gonna talk a little bit about that later. So um, application request errors are a really good first place to start, right? Because they give you a very strong signal of something that's going wrong. Uh, and then you can use tracing and logs and, and supplementary signals to tell you where to look next. Um, so, and then application latency similarly also gives you a, almost a strong signal, um, although it's not a, like a Boolean, it's more of a, a gauge, but um, it can tell you about something that's actually affecting user experience uh, or some, maybe it's leading, it could lead to cascading failures. But there's some supplementary signals like, um, for example, um, one of the most frequent causes of out outages is uh, ourselves when we deploy code. So something that you can do really easily in a Kubernetes environment is just attaching, for example, a version label, which I'm sure many of you do, to your pods, your deployments, and then understanding as your deployment progresses throughout your clusters and your environments um, where, for example, the new version is and how many environments it's progressed to. Um, and this is, this is uh, so we can actually get this metric from cube state metrics. Um, and the metric is cube pod labels here, but that applies to also you have cube deployment labels, cube daemon set labels, et cetera. Um, another supplementary signal that we can talk about, and this is included in the red method, is request rate so that we can understand when our applications are overloaded by our users. 
And then saturation as well. And I want to touch on what saturation actually means. So um, an application is saturated when its resources are saturated. So how do we know when its resources are saturated? Um, well, we can actually get, uh, if we're talking about, for example, CPU, memory, disk, network, we can get a lot of these metrics from kubelet or cube state metrics. Um, but in general, I would recommend starting with the metrics from kubelet. And that's because as we scale up, kubelet is still responsible for the pods that are running on its node. Um, so it's going to be a little bit more efficient in that sense, whereas cube state metrics is still responsible for the entire cluster and deriving metrics off the entire cluster's state. So you have to be conscious of the resources that cube state metrics requires. Um, but here we have uh, from kubelet, uh, from the first two from the embedded C advisor itself, actually, we have the CPU and memory. And additionally, there's some complementary metrics. For example, if you have persistent volumes, you can get uh, some interesting metrics off that. And to touch on cube state metrics, so it is very, uh, it does provide some very interesting metrics um, and useful metrics, one of them being container restarts. Another one is just getting an understanding of if you have a deployment, like how many pods in that deployment are available at any given time. Or um, how much of, if you have a pod disruption budget, how much of your pod disruption budget you've actually used. And this brings me to um, monitoring the control plane. So one question would be, how is monitoring the control plane different from monitoring applications? Um, and actually, it's very similar. Um, a lot of the stuff that we've learned from monitoring applications applies to monitoring the, con the control plane, uh, especially the API server, right? We can, we can basically treat the API server as another one of our applications. We can apply the red method to it, um, monitor request rate, errors, and duration. Um, and then two other things that I would say cover the bare minimum of monitoring the control plane would be just a general sense of your everything running in your cube system. Is it available? Do you see a lot of container restarts? Um, and then I would also look at etcd specifically and just make sure that it's, you know, it's, the cluster is healthy, it has quorum, it's accepting writes, um, and you don't have like really slow disk that's uh, causing you know, uh, slow, slow writes and client timeouts. Um, so that, I would say that covers the bare minimum of monitoring the control plane. And then as you start to scale up your cluster, um, the first thing that you want to be cognizant of is uh, your API server starting to consume more and more CPU and memory. Um, so you might watch for dropped requests, which manifest as 429s. Um, and you can actually adjust the number of requests that the API server can handle uh, simultaneously. Um, with the max requests in flight flag. But you have to be cognizant of the fact that as you do that, it's gonna take more resources, so you have to in kind adjust your requests and limits based on um, you know, your node count, as your node count goes up and your pod density increases and your objects churn increases. Um, and to reduce load on the API server, you can bring down, uh, you, can, you can reduce the amount that your API server clients can call it, um, but as you scale up, you probably won't be able to do that. You'll probably actually have to go the opposite direction and allow them to do more work. Um, so, so two of those clients, actually, um, as, we, as we scale, we want to pay attention to what's going on with the scheduler and the controller manager. One issue that, um, uh, that we see is that the scheduler is going to slow down as you have more pods to schedule and more nodes to schedule them on. Um, so there's two metrics, actually. One of them is exposed uh, from cube state metrics, and one of them is exposed from the scheduler, which tells us uh, how long the scheduler is taking to schedule pods. Um, and then the controller manager, uh, we want to know for each controller uh, how long it's taking to do a unit of work and how long that unit of work is sitting around in the queue before it gets acted on. So the key point there is we really just want to for those control plane components, at a minimum, we want to understand how well they're doing their key jobs. And finally, the last thing that I want to talk about is monitoring etcd. Um, so 
It's fairly straightforward. etcd is generally healthy when it has a quorum and it's accepting writes. And um, so the first thing to look at is leader elections. And just to understand whether or not your etcd cluster has a leader and uh, whether or not you're seeing constant leader changes, that can signify a, an unhealthy cluster. And then um, another thing that can lead to degraded performance is um, you, you know, your disk write performance. So um, how long it's taking etcd to commit writes. And if it's, if it's really slow, then you can see clients timing out um, as they're trying to write. Um, finally, uh, so another thing to keep in mind is the database size. So when etcd be, fills up its uh, quota for its db file, um, it's gonna trigger a no space alarm. Um, so we wanna watch for that. And additionally, um, etcd has a flag to uh, where it will periodically check for corruption. Um, so in terms of corruption, we can let etcd sort of monitor itself. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand over to my co-presenter, Nick, and he's gonna talk us through a little bit about uh, how Planet Lab set up their monitoring infrastructure. Hey, so I'm Nick. I am the Kubernetes tech lead at Planet Labs. Uh, I've previously been SRE at Google and Spotify and OfferUp with Nick. So Planet Labs, we're an Earth imaging company. We have about 160 satellites in space. They're about that big. Uh, my team has debated as to we, we say that they're about the size of a loaf of bread, and we've debated what kind of loaf of bread. We decided they're about baguette-sized. So we image 300 million square kilometers uh, every day, which is about twice the land surface of the Earth. So my team, unfortunately for you all, we work on the boring terrestrial side of things. Uh, there is a team that manages the spacecraft. We do computer vision on top of the imagery. 300 million square kilometers every day, that is a lot of imagery. Uh, it's a lot to look at with your human eyes. So my organization, our greater goal is to come up with a time series database. We call it the queryable Earth. So if you, rather than looking at a ton of imagery, if you just want to subscribe and see, is there 20 ships, container ships in Seattle today and 30 tomorrow, you can sort of subscribe to that. So our organization is about 70 people across a lot of time zones, uh, tens of microservices, uh, operational teams who are on call for their own services, run their own services. Uh, within that, there is the Kubernetes team, Hobbs. We were a Tiger team originally, which is how we got that name. Uh, I run that team, there's five of us, and we do, we both run the production Kubernetes clusters and anything to do with Kubernetes, including monitoring, logging, etc. So I got to Planet a little over a year ago, and my first day they were like, so we're doing this queryable Earth thing, we need a 5,000 node Kubernetes cluster, can you have it ready at the end of the quarter? And I was like, sure, how hard could that be? Uh, in practice, a little over a year later, we're actually between about 100 and 400 nodes at any particular point in time. We have highly elastic workloads. Uh, we see about 15,000 requests per second at ingress uh, across two production clusters. Uh, we run on Google Compute Engine. Uh, we don't use GKE because reasons. We probably would if we started again today, but we're not using GKE at the moment. So, I think every different organization and team has a slightly different monitoring philosophy, and I think it's useful to talk about mine before I talk about, or well, my teams, before I talk about how we actually monitor and practice the planet. So first, we want to page only when clusters are affected. You may notice there's an L in that word. At planet, clusters is synonymous with service owners. A uh, customer is a customer of our clusters. If they are affected, our business customers might be affected, and that would be bad. So. One example of this is when we first set up our Kubernetes clusters, um, CoreOS provided a Prometheus alert manager config that just had a bunch of stock alerts for etcd. And one of those alerts would page you if etcd disk latency was high, uh, or if there was a spike in it. And that's bad, that could lead to leader election, which can, uh, happening all the time, which can lead to failed rights, as Nick was talking about. But then we found that we'd get paged for it in the middle of the night, and be like, oh, there was a spike in latency. And it went away, there was a leader election, and the cluster kept working. So. We don't get woken up for that anymore because there was no actual impact on our customers. So sort of following on that theme, we want to page only when software won't fix the problem. Kubernetes and most cloud providers are really good. They work really hard to be self-healing. So uh, for example, in Kubernetes, you're all probably familiar with liveness and readiness probes that will replace unhealthy pods. Uh, at the cloud provider level, for us, we health check our instances' kublets. So if a kublet is unhealthy, we'll have GCE delete it and recreate it. And we don't want to page until those processes have had a chance to actually fix the problem. Uh, another more concrete example of this is that there's a bug that was recently fixed in Kubernetes 
uh, that would cause processes to get stuck in uninterruptible sleep. Uh, and basically that would cause any pods depending on those processes or containing those processes to be stuck for a long time or forever. So we used to get paged when this would happen. We'd see wedged pods. We would drain the node that they were on, cordon the node so it didn't get new pods, drain the node so that healthy pods got moved away successfully or cleanly, and then delete the node. That got really repetitive. So we wrote a piece of software, which is open source, called Drano, which uses the Kubernetes node problem detector, other open source software from Google. The node problem detector looks at signals on a node, for instance, tailing logs or running arbitrary scripts. And if it sees something that it considers bad, it sets a node condition to indicate a permanent problem with the node. Drano just looks for arbitrary configured node conditions. If it sees them, corns the node, drains the node, lets the cluster auto scale get rid of it. So we don't need to get paged anymore when that happens. Finally, we want to page only the team who can fix it. So my team is on call for Kubernetes infrastructure. My cluster members are on call for their services. Uh, this is the hardest thing, in my opinion. Um, if we see, for instance, uh, we use the Linkerd service mesh. Uh, so we get standardized request metrics across all of our services. If we see a spike in HTTP 500s or an increase in latency, if it's only affecting one service, there's a good chance that maybe they've run out of micro ESG workers or something else with their service and they need to fix that. I don't really want to get paged for that. I want them to get paged for that. On the other hand, if I see that 10 different services have had an increase in latency or increase in 500s, there's a good chance it's something to do with my infrastructure and I want to get paged for that. I want to fix it and not have my customers do that. So what do we actually monitor? I will say that we're just going to talk about sort of time series based monitoring here. We do use distributed request tracing. We do use uh, structured logging, but not going to talk about that in this talk. So this is our at a glance dashboard, uh, or the top part of it at least. If you're in my team at Planet and you get paged for something, your page probably has a link to this dashboard and a link to the run book for the alert. There are other dashboards that we have that drill down deeper into the cluster autoscaler health, core DNS health, control plane health, uh, NCD health, et cetera, et cetera. But this is typically where you start, and this is structured uh, similar to what Nick described before based on sort of the business metrics that we have. Uh, given that many different things run in my cluster and they have different actual business metrics like images downloaded and whatnot, we go for that lowest common denominator of the red method. So that top dashboard is powered by Linkerd. That is just the request rate, error rate, and to the left of that, the duration, uh, P99, I think, or P95 uh, histogram for requests. As you go further down, we have a lot of highly elastic sort of machine learning workloads that cause many nodes to get spun up and spun down. Uh, we actually, rather than alerting on scheduler latency, we actually just alert on the total time that pods are in pending. So if pods are in pending for any reason for too long, uh, for instance, nodes can't spin up or whatever, we'll be alerted to fix that. But we also graph that there. Uh, a fun fact, all those little purple triangles beneath that dashboard, that is Drano remediating broken nodes. So we see that a lot. And Drano comes in and kicks in and shoots those nodes. Uh, at the very bottom, you'll see what Nick talked about before. We show you the running software versions. This cluster was running pretty much all the same set of software versions, and to the right of that, in the bottom right corner, you'll see the running container version. So we can correlate if there's a new version of CoreOS, which we run, and latency goes up at the same time, then we can see those on those dashboards as sort of matching patterns. Uh, Alerts-wise, um, we break everything into high and low urgency alerts. So for instance, that etcd disk latency thing that I spoke about before, we didn't completely get rid of that alert, we just made it not wake people up. Uh, High urgency alerts for us means you get woken up in the morning, you fix it. Low urgency means you fix it sometime during your on-call shift. And fixing it might just mean silencing it for a couple of months and putting a bug in to look at it at some point in the future. So high urgency alerts are pretty much is something that is critical to the cluster broken and do we feel that auto remediation hasn't worked? So our ingress, have we lost ingress nodes and they didn't come back and we expect them to come back within n minutes because of auto remediation? Or have we lost uh, control pods, you know, core DNS, is that down? Any, all of our control pods go in kube system, so basically if any pod is unhealthy in kube system, then that's bad, and we, we alert on that after we've given Kubernetes a chance to fix it. We also, we use Linkerd1, so we use uh, that service mesh, and that means that we are providing that as a service to all of our uh, customers. So we will also page if we see average uh, errors increasing across like 10 different services, multiple different service dimensions, as I mentioned before. Low urgency alerts, um, there's a lot of them. Some of the interesting ones are if we lose one etcd follower, that's low urgency because we can tolerate two failures. So we lose one follower, low urgency, we fix it that week. If we lose two followers, one more means the cluster's balked, so we page. Uh, probably the most noisy and also the most useful is this alert that we've tuned a lot about pod restarts or container restarts within a pod. Uh, 
we actually just, we used to try and do fancy things. Now, just if any pod has a container that restarts 10 times, we page low urgency. It's almost never something that's actually seriously broken, but it's very often a sort of canary for underlying problems in the cluster that you might want to go follow up on later. So, as I mentioned before, our customers are operationally responsible. At the end of the day, they get to choose what metrics are important to them when they instrument their services. Uh, they set up their own dashboards and their own alerts. Um, we provide the monitoring infrastructure for them, and we also try and provide some standardized metrics. And those come from the Linkerd service mesh and from Kubernetes. They mostly come from KubeState metrics that Nick mentioned. We provide them with the count of pod restarts for their services. We provide them with the health of their pods, the, you know, for a deployment, how many replicas they want versus how many they have. We also provide them concrete resource utilization, which is semi-useful. We, more interestingly, we provide them CPU and memory, et cetera, utilization as a percentage of their requests and limits so they can tune those. And we're in the process of open sourcing some software uh, called Costanza that will actually tell you roughly how much your services cost rather than just it's using 10 CPUs, it's, it's using $50 a month or something like that. Um, I would say the main value here is just that these requests are standardized. So if I understand how my service works, I understand how your service works from a monitoring perspective. If I move to your team, I don't have to learn too much. Uh, if, I, if your service is overloading mine, I can go and sort of understand all of that pretty quickly. So you may have noticed that we said we were sort of talking about open source, and that was actually a SignalFX dashboard that I showed you before. Uh, SignalFX is our monitoring vendor. We've used them at Planet for a long time. We like them a lot. Uh, particularly their billing model works well for us, and, uh, but it ties to cardinality. Basically, they bill you for data points per minute, or at least that's what they bill us for. So if you have three time series and you sample once a minute, you're paying for three data points per minute. When we first set up our naive monitoring implementation, it worked great, it did everything that we wanted for it, and we were sending about 110,000 data points per minute to SignalFX, which was more than a fifth of Planet's total budget for monitoring just for the Kubernetes cluster infrastructure, not even the things running on the clusters. So we took a, a somewhat of a novel approach to fixing this, and we basically put a Prometheus in it. Uh, before I go too much into this, I want to say that this is a controversial pattern within the uh, Prometheus community. If you look at Prometheus issue 3902, there's a lot of discussion about this. But as many of you may know, Prometheus supports remote write, so it can store its time series in S3 or GCS or various different backends. And SignalFX implements that backend, so we can use Prometheus to basically write to SignalFX. Furthermore, Prometheus supports recording rules. So you can take something that might be, let's say, HTTP request rate across 100 pods broken down by uh, status code. That might be hundreds of time series. We average that, or rather we sum it up on the, uh, on the service name, and we just send to SignalFX, your service is doing this many requests per second in this cluster, not on this pod or on this container or anything like that. It dramatically sort of reduced our DPM that we were sending to SignalFX. And sort of, this is obvious in retrospect, but one other thing I was really pleased by was it also really increased our observability. Like Prometheus is the lingua franca of cloud native monitoring, monitoring, and other things tend to trail it a little bit. So just moving to Prometheus meant that we sort of suddenly had more visibility into cloud, uh, sorry, into core DNS, the auto scaler, things like that. So I think the main things that I've learned after sort of a year of trying to trying to deliver this is that. Uh, it's difficult to balance under versus overloading. I'm a grumpy SRE and I tend to basically be like, you shouldn't page my team unless you know that it's my problem. And this has led to situations where my clusters have been paged due to what was my problem. And we have to have a conversation with them and work with them to improve both of our alerting systems or both of our alerting patterns to make sure the right people are getting alerted. Um, you have to kind of look deep when your service teams are asking for availability, uh, sorry, uh, observability patterns. Uh, one example was that we had one team that made it seem like the most critical thing that our org could do was get distributed request tracing in place. So we got it in place. I love it. I use it a lot. Almost no one else uses it at Planet. They're all sort of stuck in the sort of let's use structured logging instead. So uh, now we sort of pay a lot more attention. When someone asks for something, we talk to everyone and we're like, hey, will you all really find this useful? Can we like have a big discussion, put some design docs out there, find what, what everyone actually wants? As I say, it's hard to beat Prometheus uh, in the monitoring space for Kubernetes. But a lot of people shy away from it because you have to run your own alert manager, run your own Grafana, you're on the hook for like really important stuff within your org. Um, we have found at Planet that we can find a compromise that works for us at least, where Prometheus is kind of like the monitoring agent and aggregation layer. And then we just let our monitoring vendor take care of making sure that their dashboards are up and alerts are happening and things like that. All right, and now I'll hand you back over to Nick to wrap it up. <laughs>
So uh, to summarize, um, Kubernetes monitor monitoring environment is fairly complex. Um, and when, you're, when we're monitoring applications, you know, start with the metrics that actually affect your users, the most important metrics. Um, but when we're talking about the control plane and scaling up uh, your cluster, um, that involves reactively tuning based on some key metrics, uh, for example, your scheduler latency or controller manager, how much time it's taking to consume or do an item of work. Um, and, and then as Nick mentioned, um, it really helps to approach your philosophy around uh, setting up a monitoring environment um, to do what works for you and your organization because every organization is different. Um, so with that, thank you guys for coming. Um, appreciate it. And uh, some links here. Uh, you can find us on Twitter and GitHub. And uh, some of the open source projects that Nick mentioned are linked here as well. Um, so we're going to take questions after the talk and just grab us, come talk to us uh, for questions, feedback. Uh, if you want to grab beers, that's fine too. Thank you. Thank you.